Hello, welcome to uh, this short presentation on Galapagos and um, telling you about things you might want to know before planning your trip. Galapagos is a, a usually a major investment on the part of uh, visitors to the islands and it's often a once in a lifetime destination. So before you just jump aboard and, 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 and go there, it's, it's, uh, it's worth spending a few, a few moments, even uh, some time learning about the islands and learning about the different travel modes, the pros and cons, so that you're best prepared to make a decision that will ensure the best possible visit for you there. My name is Mark Patry. I'm part of the team, a small team of people who run and own and operate CNH tours, cultural and natural heritage tours. We've been doing this for 22 years. I'd like to present my team to you before we get going very quickly. Um, on our team, we have the TripAdvisor Galapagos Destination Expert. We also have a voting member of the Charles Darwin Foundation General Assembly. Uh, we have a board member of the International Galapagos Tour Operators Association. We have a former Canadian Embassy representative in Galapagos and a former United Nations representative for Galapagos Conservation for 10 years. Together, the three of us have a collective 16 years of experience living and working in Galapagos with the Charles Darwin Foundation and the Galapagos National Park Service. And finally, because we're based in Ontario, Canada, we are regulated under the Travel Industry Council of Ontario. You benefit from the Ontario Travel Industry Compensation Fund should anything go wrong, but rest assured, nothing has ever gone wrong in the 22 years of, of existence of our company. Before we get going, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to introduce you to what Galapagos is all about. Why is Galapagos so special? Why do people from around the world want to travel there? It is actually the first ever site to have been inscribed onto the UNESCO's World Heritage List in 1978. Uh, today, there are over a thousand such sites inscribed, but this was the first one. That says a lot. Why was it the first one? Well, it's a place where you can see biological evolution in action. It is, it is where you can get graphic manifestations of life forms changing and adapting to different environments. And why, why is Galapagos special for that? Well, there are a number of reasons. And I'll, let's just quickly go over them so that when you do visit the islands, you'll be able to say, yes, I remember. One, their origin. It's an oceanic archipelago. These islands emerged from the sea five or six million years ago. They emerged lifeless. They were never connected to the mainland. So the species you have there today had to find their way, they, their way there directly. And, uh, and it was very difficult to get there in the first place. The fact that they're very far from the mainland, 600 miles or a thousand kilometers also creates a barrier uh, for the movement of species back and forth. Meaning that if a species actually gets there, they, they are rarely, their, their genes are rarely mixed with new arrivals uh, down the line. And therefore changes that take place in Galapagos are, are preserved. There's also a tremendous amount of habitat diversity in, in Galapagos. There are many islands, there are many different sizes, different ages and altitudes. Uh, some of them face the, are leeward, facing the leeward winds and, some, and, and uh, sometimes they're facing the windward winds resulting in drier or wetter sides. All this creates different habitats that force species to evolve uh, in order to make best use of their habitats. And also the islands are located at widely varying distances from each other. We have islands that are no closer than 50 kilometers or 30 miles to another, while other islands are just neighboring uh, their, their nearby island, therefore facilitating or making more difficult the exchange of genes and species between islands. And finally, the currents. There are a variety of currents that bathe the archipelago from warm currents coming up from the north cold currents coming, coming from the south all the way from Antarctica and deep cold upwellings coming from the west. These create diverse marine and coastal habitats and bring colonizing species from vastly different parts of the world. You have tropical fish in Galapagos coexisting with penguins. Nowhere else can we see this. So it's an ideal place to observe evidence of biological evolution. This is what Darwin wrote on Galapagos. Hence, both in space and time, 
we seem to be brought somewhat near to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on this earth. That was a big deal back then, back in Darwin's day. The common thought was that God had created everything as it was, unchanging. And Darwin started cluing in to the fact that things did change, new life forms did appear. It was a frightening realization for him. So what is the result of all these forces that created Galapagos? Well, you have a bizarre collection of animal and plants that are seen nowhere else in the world. You have a very rich and diverse marine life, including many large bodied marine species. And most animals are completely unafraid of humans because they've never been subjected to predators. You have also uh, otherworldly volcanic landscapes, lunar. So here are a few examples of the kinds of experiences you might get exposed to while in Galapagos. Nothing is guaranteed. Some are more common than others and many others have not been mentioned in this brief overview, but I just throw them out here for your, 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 your interests. On a trail, you might come upon a marine iguana traffic jam, or it could be a nesting blue-footed booby. Either way, these animals will not see the way for you. It is up to you to walk around them. I've come across super pods of dolphins on two occasions in my time in Galapagos. It is a sight worth seeing. Something you're guaranteed to have. first cup of coffee on deck as the sun rises above a remote island. You're far from everything, miles and miles away from civilization. There's a sense of, of, of peace and tranquility it's, that is hard to find elsewhere. You, of course, will get the chance to walk on some very recent volcanic lava flows or swim with penguins, sea lions, sea turtles, and rays, and dare I say, even sharks. And uh, this is a, a wonderful spectacle of dive bombing boobies who reach, who discover uh, schools of fish and then start uh, feeding, uh, undertaking a feeding frenzy, very, frenzy, a very, very nice spectacle. And if you're lucky, your naturalist guide will spot, help you spot these hard to find wonders of the undersea world, like a seahorse or even an octopus, or you might even spot a hammerhead shark. Last time I was in Galapagos, I spotted a hammerhead shark. They're harmless. Of course, you'll have to learn to share the beach with the locals. You'll, whether they be pelicans or sea lions, you'll invariably run across these animals on the beach with you. And one of the things we don't think about when we go to Galapagos, especially when you're in a ship, are the brilliant dark skies. And uh, for those of you who haven't had a chance yet, the Southern Cross is easily visible from Galapagos and uh, it's always a thrill to spot it for the first time. Let's get into travel logistics. How do you get to Galapagos? How does one get there in the first place? Well, typically, uh, most, I would say, in fact, all incoming international flights arrive in continental Ecuador later at night. So you'll be arriving 9, 10, 11 o'clock at night into Quito or Guayaquil. We recommend that you plan on two nights in Quito or Guayaquil as a buffer against the vicissitudes of travel. There may be a snowstorm on the way down for those of you coming, those of you coming from northern climates, there may be lost luggage, or missed connection, you never know. So please, if you're planning on going to, on a Galapagos cruise, plan on spending two nights in Quito or on the mainland before heading out. Quito is a lovely city. I've been around myself in many cities across Latin America, in, Central, in South America, and I would say Quito is the most beautiful capital city of them all. Then you catch a morning flight to Galapagos. The flights may leave as early as eight o'clock, perhaps as late as 10, it all depends on the plan. And if you're boarding a ship, uh, usually the flight is coordinated with the ship departure time. There are fixed overhead costs for getting to Galapagos from the mainland. And these amount to about $675 US, including the domestic flight, a park entrance fee and a transit card. So this is something you have to budget into your, your trip. We have a lot of people asking us, when is the best time of year to go to Galapagos? And frankly, any time of year is a good time of year. Perhaps you will have certain uh, preferences, but you'll never be disappointed in terms of being exposed to a wide variety of wildlife, wildlife behaviors, both, both above and below the sea. There are, having said this, there are two general seasons in Galapagos. First one is the hot season. 
And then and here the dates are approximate because things change uh, from year to year, but generally from January to April, uh, it'll be quite hot under the sun and, and the noonday sun is, is uh, some will call oppressive. The evenings will be warm, very pleasant. Uh, you, you may have occasional short-lived tropical downpours. These themselves are a spectacle for those who haven't witnessed a real tropical downpour. They're fun, they're, they're amazing, they're powerful. Uh, but never the, the, the rains are never long-lasting and never permanent. The vegetation greens up during this time of year, and the seas are generally warmer and calmer. Although you can get choppy seas any time of year in Galapagos, they're, more, they're less frequent during the January-April period. And having said that also, you never get storms in Galapagos. The seas are never massively violent with huge swells, so that's never something to worry about. Then we have the Garua season, which lasts from about June to November. During the Garua season, it is, tends to be warm under the sun. The evenings are fresher. You might want to wear a sweater and long trousers. It's dry, but uh, you may have a very frequent fine mists, particularly in the early mornings or late afternoons. And this picture below is typical of a, a late afternoon a sky in Galapagos during the Gurua season. It's low overcast and you might have such a fine mist, so fine that you really don't have to worry about an umbrella. The deciduous plants lose their leaves, so the, the, the landscape can start looking, the, the vegetation starts looking like, for those of you, those of you who live in northern areas, uh, like uh, autumn trees that have lost all their leaves. The seas are generally cooler and more frequently choppy. And of course, there's the shoulder season. So sometime around December, May, June, is you're kind of mixing and matching both the hot and Garua season conditions. Uh, what's the best time of year for wildlife? As I noted a few minutes ago, any time of year is good. You'll guarantee to see all kinds of different things. But I, 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 here I provide a few examples of what you might see and when you might see it, with sea lions giving birth in August, September, marine iguanas nesting early in the year with the eggs hatching a bit later. The blue-footed boobies, which are a bit of an iconic species in Galapagos, their numbers fluctuate and their nesting is opportunistic. They may nest in May, they may nest in November, it all depends from year to year, but you'll be guaranteed to see blue-footed boobies, they're pretty common in the islands. The dolphins are present all year long, the penguins are present all year long, although they're more found more on the western shores of the archipelago. You'll see lots of the Darwin's finches, uh, different varieties on different islands. Uh, lots of sea turtles with them laying eggs uh, at the end of the year with hatchlings coming up at the beginning of the year. Rays and sharks are common. Some of the iconic species you might want that if you are planning on or want to see, you, you will have to plan for that. For instance, the waved albatross shown in the lower picture here uh, is present only from about late April to November. After, between those months or after those months, they're not there in the islands, they're off wandering at sea. Um, and their fledglings this, uh, uh, get going in August, November on Española Island only. They do have a peak in terms of their behavioral display in July. Uh, the birds will start doing their courtship dances in, in May, but it's not until about July that they're really good at it and confident in their, in their, in their dances and they're, they're doing it quite regularly. The flightless cormorant is another iconic species. It is seen all year long on Fernandina Island. Uh, but courtship and nesting happens usually in July, August. And the giant tortoise is in the wild. They're not that common. There are not many visitor sites where you see them. Uh, and they're usually best seen in the rainy season when they come down from the highlands. Although you will see them, they're quite common uh, on Santa Cruz Island. They're running, or actually not running, but they're quite common in the farms up there, um, plodding along. And you may have a chance to see them also in the breeding centers where they, they lumber about in good numbers. Land iguanas, as we see in the picture on the top, they're quite common, um, but you'll see them on select islands only. And the red-footed boobies are also visible all year long, but again, on select islands. So if you absolutely must want to see some of these species uh, before choosing your trip and your itinerary, it's good to point that out. So you decided to go to Galapagos, usually the choice that confronts people is either if they're going to do it by land or by ship. So we'll cover the both options here in a short presentation. So you get an idea what are the pros and cons on each, each way of doing this. I'll start with land-based. Land-based means you're staying in hotels. You're not staying uh, at night on a ship. 
uh, you'll be joining day trips to visitor sites on a daily basis. You'll be returning to your hotel at the end of the day. You'll have free evenings. There are a wide range of models and you can have full packages of varying links which means you pay a price and you, you, you show up at the hotel and they'll take care of everything. There are no more decisions to make. You'll have a schedule of, of, of activities every day. Uh, yes, fixed menu of daily options. And you'll be, you may also be doing island hopping. You can buy this package where you spend three days on one island, move to another settlement on another island and do the same there. Or you can choose to stay in one island for the entirety of your stay. The price ranges here vary greatly from 250 to 1250 us dollars per person per day uh, this would include accommodation the site visits and the meals um, of course the lower range means you'll be staying in you know, basic hotels whereas the higher range you'll be staying in some of the nicest boutique hotels in the islands some of the uh, advantages of being land-based you have a variety of downtime options. When you're back at the hotel, you're free to walk in town, explore, uh, go for coffee or, or a beer or drink somewhere. You have the opportunity to take the day off. If you feel like you've seen enough, you wanna just stay at the hotel for a day, you can do that. You'll be on solid ground. For some people, this is an important consideration. And also there are more options for budget-friendly visit. If you don't mind eating beans and rice with a leg of chicken every day, and staying uh, in a very basic hotel, you can visit Galapagos on a much more friendly budget. But there are some, I believe, disadvantages in doing a land-based trip. Um, instead of being on a boat that's cruising along at uh, 10 miles an hour, uh, you'll be on a fast speed boat uh, that's taking you from, from your main island to your visitor sites on other islands. You may end up spending two or three hours uh, each way on a fast boat on a bumpy seat and that in a sense is a lot more uncomfortable than being on a slow boat. You'll be arriving at your visitor sites closer to midday when the sun is brightest and hottest and when wildlife has started to go into the resting mode after being active earlier in the morning. You'll also be restricted to visitor sites within range of inhabited islands. They're more visited, they're more, they're, they're perhaps the animals there are are perhaps less inclined to be uh, less disturbed by people. And your downtime is spent in an urban environment. For some, that's good. For others, uh, perhaps it's not what they're expecting in Galapagos. There are different land-based options. Uh, I'd like to illustrate to you the types of options for a higher end land base. You have a very comfortable boutique hotels with pools and restaurants and everything is taken care of. And here's a picture of the um, one place I've been to and very much on almost on the peak of a hill very nice during the hot season but during the Garua season it is it is locked in with misty clouds uh, basically 24 hours a day so it's much less pleasant that time of year it organizes dedicated day trips uh, it has its own ships with quality service and meals and its own naturalist guide so it ensures the quality of the product from 24 hours a day you can choose then a more mid-range type of hotel, a three-star hotel that is uh, more designed for larger groups. Uh, they have a pool. They may share their day trips with other groups on, um, on ships that they don't manage themselves, therefore uh, have less control over the quality. And then there are some lower end hotels, uh, basic uh, type of uh, you stay there and then you're instructed to meet the group at the pier at a certain time as opposed to being taken there in, in the hotel vehicle and they book day trips operated by other companies so again they're looking at other lower end day trips with lower end quality guides and whatnot but price is more uh, is easier on the wallet when you're, if you're considering a ship-based visit these are the things that uh, you might want to think about uh, itineraries, they range from as short as 14 to as long as 15 days. Standard itinerary for most people who go to Galapagos is eight days, seven nights on a ship. There are 65 ships that ply Galapagos waters and they range in size from 12 to 100 passengers. Although the vast majority, I would say maybe 50 ships carry 20 or fewer passengers. There's a lot of uh, choice and diversity of choice in the smaller ship category, while the larger ship categories tend to be on the, on the pricier end of things. They range from tourist to luxury comfort levels. With 
You can charter an entire ship for family and groups. There are 12, 14, 16 passenger ships, and that is a, a fun thing to do and a, not an uncommon thing to do for those who can arrange it. And here prices will range from as low as 400 to as high as 1250 or even more dollars per person per day. Some of the advantages of taking a ship, well, you access the visitor sites earlier in the morning, later in the afternoon, when wildlife is most active, when lighting is best for photography. You navigate mostly at night, so you're freeing up more time during the day for activities. It nurtures a greater sense of being away from it all. You wake up, you're not in town. In the evenings, you're not in town. Uh, you reach, you're able to reach the furthest corners of the archipelago. You're not limited to sites that are close to human settlement areas. Being on the sea for uh, up to uh, eight days, you have a much greater opportunity to run into whales and dolphins and, and uh, leaping manta rays and all other kinds of marine phenomena. You're also able to experience more of the Galapagos in limited time. Most people don't have three, four weeks to visit Galapagos. They come for a week and uh, while you're on a ship, you can pack in two, even three visitor sites a day while on a land-based tour, it may be limited to one visitor site a day, something to consider. You also, for a lot of people, this is important. You get the opportunity to develop a sense of camaraderie with the fellow passengers and crew. It's a team spirit. You're all in this together. You're all, you're all witnessing the marvels of Galapagos together and making discoveries. And, and uh, it's, it's, it helps create a great team spirit. And that's part of the fun. Some of the disadvantages of being on a ship include uh, concern over motion sickness. I have to say that we do survey our returning guests. And one of the questions we ask them is the extent to which motion sickness uh, kept them from enjoying their trip. We ask them to score that from one to five with one being not at all and five being, I had to get off the ship. And our average uh, rating is 1.8. Most people will feel some motion sickness or not most, but some people will feel it at the beginning of a trip, but they quickly get over it. And then after day one or two, they don't feel it anymore. And of course, there are many ways of dealing with motion sickness these days. Some people get concerned over being with the same people for 24 uh, hours and seven days a week. Uh, you know, you're always afraid to be being with, locked in with an obnoxious person. Well, that's a risk, of course, but there are ways of managing that. There are no low budget options. $400 US a day is uh, about as, as low as it gets in Galapagos. And you have no options for independent downtime off. When you're on the ship, you're on the ship. Of course, the ship has nooks and crannies you could find to, for a quiet moment. And you can also consider spending more time in Galapagos on land after or before your cruise, if that's something you'd like to do. So I'm giving you examples here of some, of some ship options, what they look like. Here as a higher end ship, the ship we're where I'm highlighting here is one we like very much. It has the most beautiful nautical lines in Galapagos. It's a higher end ship. Uh, the higher end ships range from as small as 12 to 100 passengers. They're finely finished. They have quality furnishings. It's, you know, it's everything you need, you would expect in a high end hotel and a high end restaurant. You can find mid range ships that are also you know, they may be more modestly sized, uh, but you know, they're, they're comfortable just as well. They're, they're well managed and the mid-range ships, you don't find any that are bigger than 20 passengers. So service is good, comfort is good, food is good. And then you have your budget ships. Uh, again, these are limited to the smaller ships. They will tend to hire lower paid naturalist guides, which means perhaps their English is not so good. Uh, perhaps they're not as excited as you'd like your guide to be. Their, their service, while decent, it will be simple. So, you know, you might have rice and beans and chicken and some uh, basic salad uh, dinner with a soup or, you know, a pudding for, for dessert kind of service. So you've gone to Galapagos, you finish your trip and it's time to go home. How does one manage the return trip home? Uh, quite simple. If you're in no rush, of course, you can spend time in Galapagos. We recommend that. It's a good time if you've taken a cruise to, uh, to spend time in the islands. Uh, you'll Typically, your ship will drop. If you've taken a ship, they'll drop you off at the airport, catch your flight back to the continent to Quito or Guayaquil, arriving in mid to late afternoon. And most international flights leave late at night 
which is usually oh, so you're usually good for making a, a connection that same that same night. You don't want to double check that again with any agent with whom you're booking your trip, but typically it can be done. You can, of course, decide to stay in Ecuador a bit longer. Ecuador is a small country, but has a lot to offer. And I'm just mentioning a very few here, and the prices are good in this country. So you might consider bird watching. I don't know if any of you are bird watchers, but of the world's approximately 10,000 bird species, there 10% of them are 1,000 birds have been reported in Ecuador, which is a, an amazing uh, proportion. There are there are a good diversity of very, very nice Amazon lodges to consider. Machu Picchu and Cusco in neighboring Peru is easily accessible. I did that trip myself not too long ago. Very impressive. Cuenca in Ecuador is a world heritage city. A lot of uh, North American uh, retirees have decided to make that their retirement home. Uh, it's quiet, beautiful, a colonial city, a uh, small city, and very nice, good weather. You can perhaps decide to go horseback riding in the high Andes and spot some condors. The cloud forest is nearby where you have a diversity of birds and hummingbirds and uh, interesting uh, forest. So there's a lot of options there to consider and talk to your agent, see if you're interested to see what might be done. So that's it. We are CNH Tours um, with Heather Blenkiron, Kelsey Bradley, and myself, Mark Patry. We'd be happy to lend you a hand. We are experts. We know what we're talking about. We've been doing this for over 20 years. We've sent nearly 5,000 people to Galapagos during that time. And uh, they've all come back very, very happy with their experience. There's our contact information. Let us know if we can help you. We're here all the time. Thank you.